Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 8. Um, the Queen Whoever Was, of the Season 2 finale. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of House of the Dragon. So I have to start with a spoiler warning for House of the Dragon up to the Season 2 finale, Season 2, Episode 8. If you have not seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things will be spoiled for you. So, <clears throat> I gotta be honest, I know that there's some people out there who will say that I had unrealistic expectations of this episode or unrealistic expectations of the season. But I will say, you know, the episode itself was a decent episode. It was a strong episode, a lot of good character moments, a lot of moments that I really liked. But when I'm judging it as the season finale, I think it fails miserably. Um... And I think the season overall, as a whole, it reflects poorly on the poor pacing. Now, I don't have any expectations that it needs to stick entirely true to the book. Uh, in fact, there are some moments in this episode which I'm sure some book readers are going to be up in arms about and pissed off about changes from the book. But me personally, I don't really mind that much. I don't mind if they stray outside of the confines of the book i don't mind if they stray outside my expectations but i really think that after episode four um the show kind of came to a screeching halt and started moving at a snail's pace now last week's episode did um do a lot to push the story forward so i thought maybe we're in for there were over the lull and we're gonna start hitting the gas but no this episode was nothing but a pardon the phrase a cock tease is basically what it amounted to and i think that really upsets me i wouldn't call i wouldn't say i'm disappointed i am kind of disappointed but i would more say pissed off that because the storytelling and the the acting and the the basis of the story is so good and they've been nailing certain aspects of the um of the story so well but the fact that they're getting the pacing completely wrong really upsets me um because there was an event from the books which i will not spoil because it hasn't happened yet but it should have happened by the end of season two everyone's saying that it should have happened i've heard some be and even uh it just made a lot of sense which is why they were saying it's not like oh my theory wasn't true so i'm upset i hate that's such a straw man bullshit <laughs> it's not that case at all it's the fact that it made the most sense which is why so many people were predicting the season to end with a certain event and the fact that they're just pushing everything off and Alright, I'll get into the details as I go along. But, uh, so let me jump into the episode. So, uh, we're starting with Tylen negotiating with the Triarchy. Um, these scenes were okay. Um, they were, you know, somewhat comical. It's not sort of my cup of tea for sense of humor. Um, but, you know, parts with Tylen singing and whatnot. But it shows the, you know, length they're going to that they're trying to make um allies with these pirates who you know have a different sort of you know whole manner and demeanor than the westerosi lords so that aspect was kind of interesting i guess um now this is a next we get to aemon attacking sharp point now this is what really confused me because i remember i saw this scene like a snippet of the scene in the trailer and i was like oh i wonder what he's attacking what is he attacking and when i saw the scene i still had no idea what the hell he was attacking and then um in a line of dialogue jace mentions oh he attacked sharp point so i was like okay that's 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 terrible what is sharp point exactly like where is it what is it like why is it important why do you attack it like what and so i had to wait till the after the episode for like someone in the behind the scenes thing to be like oh that's uh you know lord massey or whatever one of the 
you know, grumpy old men on Rhaenyra's council. That's one of his keeps. I'm like, okay, okay, so why was that not mentioned in the episode? And then after the episode, I had to go and look it up on the map and see where exactly it was. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's kind of near Dragonstone. So what? <laughs> I don't know. And this gets to a greater frustration about which I'll get to shortly on another storyline. But I will say, like, <laughs> there's no reason why I should have to look shit up. <laughs> the episode should to understand important plot points. Um, now, you can kind of get the idea that when Aemon turned around from Dragonstone, when he got, like, scared of the other dragons, that perhaps he just flew directly to Sharp Point. And just set it on fire to let out his frustrations. It's showing like how he's you know evil and just lets out frustration uh, and kills a whole bunch of people over it. And it contrasts that to Rhaenyra, who's very hesitant to kill innocent people. Anyway, I mean, <sighs> people always say like it's a marketing ploy of everyone being like, "What team are you? Team Black? Are you Team Green?" But and this has been going on for season one, where the show has been kind of, you know, skewing at the audience to be on Team Black. But this takes it to another level, where it's turning Team Green into a bunch of mustache twirly villains, and Team Black the obvious heroes. Which, I know there's some things that do go against that but it seems like th that more and more they're pushing in that direction anyway so we get another scene with um laris talking to aegon and convincing aegon to leave king's landing now i did hear someone else complaining about this and saying it was a terrible decision for aegon um i don't i don't have an issue with it it makes sense to me that i guess suppose they don't like the fact that aegon feels that he's going to be killed by his brother but again i don't have an issue with that part of it like it seems to be going along with what they're setting up here so this is all fine to me um and then we actually see them leaving king's landing at the end of the episode so I, i'm actually curious about it. i think this is interesting but then again it was part of that you know <sighs> that fucking montage at the end but i'll get to that anyway so we see rhaenyra is being pushed into war like first and we finally get a scene where corliss is conferring with her as hand it feels like we should have gotten this earlier and um he says oh my ships are sail at your command and um he pushes her to saying like look we need to act we actually need to go into war and so she goes to the dragon riders and says the same thing and like they seem hesitant and and upset of like oh you know i'm not sure oh we're actually going to war so this leads into my other issue is that this is reminding me of game of thrones season seven which is something you don't want to do and yes i will get to the <laughs> the whole vision thing which is another thing but that's a more direct reference to game of thrones this is a more indirect reference and so much that daenerys was go oh i don't want to help innocent people i don't want to burn king's landing with my dragons and everyone around her is like no don't kill the innocent people meanwhile like lannisters and cersei are going around killing everyone without and and they look weak and dumb for just sitting there and doing nothing while their enemies going around running crazy and so i got that same vibe here where damon uh, i'm sorry Aemond doesn't have any qualms of going around burning castles and they've already taken over rook's rest and, and duskendale and all these other places and she's just sitting on her ass even after she has seven fucking dragons now granted she is making promise to uh, do something finally but as that a huge hesitation again it seems like they're pushing they're really pushing no oh, she's the hero good guy and the rest are evil and and uh, yeah i don't know i like the story to be a bit more gray than that and the fact that oh yes she's going to do something in two years whenever season three years it should have happened this season <laughs> it should have happened this season Anyway, I'm sorry. So <laughs> next we get into um, 
you know, the bastards kind of misbehaving, Ulf in particular. I think this was a somewhat interesting scene, although I think that they should have toned Ulf down a tad. Uh, and I'm hoping that they do tone him down a little bit, even though I know that he's meant to be the drunk and the fool, and that's how he was portrayed in the books as well. But I still feel like that they could just tone it down a little bit and it seems like they are setting up for a huge personal conflict between him and jace because jace is already against the whole idea of them becoming bastards and because he feels like it uh diminishes his position and the fact ulf was kind of, oh we're the same is really pushing his buttons in the worst way possible but hugh was actually being very polite and i don't think he was getting enough credit from jace about that but i did like the scene between jace and bella i've always liked this relationship and i love that the show is flushing it out way more than it was in the books and that bella is kind of pushing jace to be like you know you're getting all hung up on this father thing you think you're the first you know, uh, noble who's, who, you know, whose parents aren't who they supposed to be, which I think was a damn good point. And she's like, you need to go out and support your mother. And I do like in the dinner scene, he did sort of stand up and supported Rhaenyra on her decision to go to war and saying, this is what we need to do and stood by her. I love that. And I think we do need to get, um, a bit more of that. So, um, then we see um, Aemon confronting Helena, kind of pushing her, saying, we well, need to ride your dragon, which makes all the sense in the world, because they are now super outnumbered by uh, Rhaenyra's dragons, but she refuses to do that, says that she doesn't want to hurt anyone, and Allison got really pissed off with him, saying that he just wants death and destruction, which kind of will motivate Allison to do what she does later on. But we see that Helena actually appears in Aemon, or Damon's, I I always get them confused in Damon's vision which is really interesting and it seems like she was almost on the when she was on the balcony she was talking directly to Damon but then Eamon comes out and um you know says tries to you know the softer approach like look you know didn't mean to be mean or anything but you know Rhaenyra's coming with seven dragons to kill us all so it would be cool if you could you know find a way to you know get on your own dragon and maybe help out here a bit <laughs> and that approach doesn't work with it either and we get more of the prophecy you know seer side of her where she just points out like i don't know like aegon's gonna sit on the throne a wooden throne and you're gonna die <laughs> you'll be swallowed up by the godwood uh god's eye or whatever she said and uh yeah, that was effectively creepy scene. I did not have an issue with it. And I love the Eamon's reaction. It's like, I could have you murdered. I could have you killed. And Helena's like, well, I won't change anything. <laughs> like, I love that uh, fearlessness in her. And so her character is very different from the book side. It makes me curious of where they're taking her. Um, speaking of Damon's vision, we get, uh, first of all, Sir Alfred shows up, and what a fucking dick, may I say this, uh, because Rhaenyra sent him there, like, Rhaenyra told him, like, oh, I think Damon might try to, you know, might be trying to rebel from me, he's like, surely he would not dare do that, and then he shows up, and he basically pushes him to do that, he's like, oh yeah, Rhaenyra's faltering, she's sucking and everything, and I need you to take over. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Are you kidding me right now with this bullshit? But thankfully, even though it was a lot of... It took too long and a lot of slow play, stretched out story of Damon finally coming after so many fucking episodes of sitting in Heron Hall and having all these visions, finally coming to the decision to support Rhaenyra. Now, granted, he has one more vision where they have another shameless Game of Thrones plug of Daenerys and the White Walkers. Now, I do I think this is a little cheesy? Yes. Do I not like being reminded of Game of Thrones Season 8? 100%. But uh, that being said, I, I am not, like, furious about this. Like, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. It's definitely not what the thing that bothers me most about the episode. The thing that bothers me most about the episode is the pacing and how nothing actually happens. Uh, <laughs> that's what bothers me. This vision, 
I mean, it goes along with the whole Viserys talking about the Song of Ice and Fire. So that's the path the show's already chosen. So this makes sense to continue along that path. And that this is what would finally push Damon over the edge and be like, look, this is bigger than us. We need to support you. Now, that scene where Rhaenyra does show up and uh, because Simon Strong <laughs> called her there saying, oh, no, I think some shit might be going down. And uh, and Damon, uh, the way he, you know, kneel, bends the knee in front of her and everyone else bends the knee in front of her and he says, you know, uh, says we fight for our queen. Like, that was an amazing scene. It was such a good, powerful scene. I do think it was well-earned, maybe a little too well earned and we should have could have sped this whole thing up but still i mean could have happened earlier in the season i'm not saying i'm just saying but i still um really great scene um so then uh we get this other scene where alan confronts corliss which i thought was a pretty powerful scene as well that he's kind of when corliss is trying to be more like a, a father to him he points out like look you're abandoned us you wouldn't acknowledge me i was starving i could barely feed myself and you ignored me but now that your son and your daughter is dead and your heir that took your son's place is also dead now all of a sudden you're cozying up to me well bullshit and that makes sense and i do wonder how they are going to further uh this relationship further um so Speaking of storylines that went at a snail's pace that were taking too way too long, Reina, Reina is running through the veil searching for a dragon, and we get like various scenes scattered throughout the episode that are like thirty seconds long of her going through the veil, and starving, and having to drink water from a pond like she's thirst, dying of thirst, and and then freezing in the cold while she runs off to the, trying desperately trying to find a dragon, and then at the end of the episode she finally sees the dragon and it hisses at her, and that's fucking it. Are you fucking serious right now? Like. <laughs> <laughs> we got like she, she saw like the sheep things in a couple of, like episode 5 or 6 or something and she was like oh what is this is it, it's a dragon and in episode 6 she runs off to chase the dragon like they keep teasing and teasing and teasing and teasing and she doesn't even get the fucking dragon by the end of the season like that is some bullshit like this is very symbolic or for the whole way this whole season has been stretched out way too long now it's just bad pacing especially when compared to season one which went at such a fast pace and then came to a halt in season two and so it's whiplash which i don't think works at all but anyway um so we get this fun the final scene is with allison going to Rhaenyra. Now, this is the thing I know a lot of book readers are going to be complaining about. Not all of them, but I can see a lot being like, oh my god! Because this is a massive change from the book. But you know, I actually didn't have an issue with this. It is the least of my concerns. I, I, I'm perfectly happy for the show to take something different. I think it is a much more interesting dynamic, because in the books Alicent and Rhaenyra were just both kind of like oh fuck these people that's your separate i want to kill them oh screw them and and that's not that interesting like this is more interesting to me this is allison willing finally being convinced like by the way this is what's a, such a good acted scene this is why i'm not gonna care if it's if oh my god it, it totally destroys what they were doing in the books i don't care because it was such a well-written scene it was such a well-acted scene both actors like just fucking like I nailed this absolutely nailed it like the way you see Allison kind of sort of crying you actually see Rhaenyra like reacting to Allison crying and she gets a little choked up like it was such it was like one of the best acted scenes in the entire show um and as for would I buy that Allison would be finally convinced to um actually let Rhaenyra K kill Aegon and be willing to give up King's Landing absolutely now as much as again the allison thing has been stretched out way too long um i buy it i do buy it and i think it works 
Now we get this ending montage where we see all the various armies marching to war. We see um, Otto Hightower apparently being held prisoner. We don't know by whom. We don't know where. So that's yeah. Thanks a lot for that. Like what? The, uh, what the fuck? And then we see like uh, we see Tessarion, whatever that blue dragon, uh, that Dayron who we haven't met yet rise. We haven't seen Dayron yet season three that's not surprising i didn't expect to see dayron this season that's fine but the whole thing with i remember i saw this in the trailers of the starks marching the army and the lannisters marching the army and the you know um the river lords marching the army and um i expected to see this at the start of the episode not in the episode with this and be like haha wait for season three that is bullshit it is bullshit. This is this whole ending montage is not nothing but a fucking cock tease. And here's the end. Here's the here's the kicker to this. Two years. We gotta wait two fucking years to see this finally go somewhere. Now, it's possible that once uh, years from now, once the whole show is finished, I might be like, oh no, I understand why they had to pace it that way because they need to set the things up for season three and if they got to these scenes in season two it would happen too early and and, and we'd lose the pacing in season three maybe i'll think that way but uh, i'm not thinking about some possible hypothetical future right now i gotta wait two fucking years to get any sort of things that i think that should have happened in episode six and things i should have you know this as this season was actually well paced at the start. Uh, episodes one and two were, were on point. Three dragged a little bit, but then four was amazing. And then after that, the whole pacing took a dive, um, as I said. And I think, yeah, as I said, it's episode seven kind of made up for that a little bit. And I thought this episode would make up for it. But no, it goes back to the, oh, wait till next season, which is two years. Two years. Here's the thing, they, and this is what I'm saying across the board. For anyone who thought I had unrealistic expectations or thinking I wanted my theories to be true or any other um, straw man bullshit like that, here's the thing. I'm judging this the exact same way I would judge any other show, movie, whatnot. I always complain. I'm very consistent about this. I always complain. If there is, I was just the acolyte came out recently. I complained about that. If there's, or Ahsoka or any other stuff, I always complain consistently. If something ends, like a season or, or a movie that has a sequel, um, if it ends without there being enough of a conclusion. Now, that doesn't mean that um, they're not leaving anything for the next movie or for the next season. They can leave tons of stuff. Like, I think there could have been tons of things, um, such as whatever, you know, what becomes of the triarchy sailing towards King's Landing. I'm perfectly happy for them to push that back for season three and other things. I'm perfectly happy you need to save some things for season three i get that but we needed some sort of conclusion because all season like all these armies we've been seeing damon was building an army where nero was you know getting dragons we needed some kind of just a, one moment that that pays off this whole build up and this did not pay off any of the fucking build up it was just more build up which is bullshit since I had to wait two years. So, I'm going to have two separate ratings for this episode because I, I'm of two different minds of this episode. So, my rating for this as a standalone, independent episode of House of the Dragon is an 8. Extremely good. A lot of, a lot of strong character moments. Um... I didn't really like the visions to the Game of Thrones, but as I said, it goes along with the show. I think the Allison stuff was great. I actually have no issue with it. As I said, I know some people will. Um, 
And the Damon and Rhaenyra scene was amazing. I, you know, I wish we actually got more of Ulf and Hugh. That was also my complaint. Like, they should could have had more of them in this episode. More character moments, more beats with them. If they're going to have it, some of the other scenes with, like, Aegon and Laris. Like, those dragged on for too long. And I don't think those were particularly interesting. But, overall, it was a strong episode. With, as I said, the scene with Allison and Rhaenyra, again, was one of the best acted scenes in the whole show. So, definitely a strong episode, so I'll give it 8 out of 10. Now, the second way I'm going to rate this is not as a standalone independent episode of House of the Dragon, but as a season finale. And as a season finale, I give this a 4 poor this is a terrible season finale <laughs> and i, I it this it leaves too much open it's been building up as i said it's been building up to all this stuff like what's gonna happen and then it doesn't pay off does not pay it off in any way possible and i believe to all the naysayers out there i think it's totally possible that they could have paid this off in a small way while still leaving a whole lot of stuff for the next season like just some tiny little payoffs like some throw me some bone not in saying all the all these armies are marching the war and just end the episode which what we already knew of these armies were marching to war like that's that, <laughs> wait for season three this is too much this i think is a problem with a lot of marvel movies and star wars and all these big popular things is that they try they worry too hard about getting you to come back from the next thing that they don't realize that they need to pay off the thing that you are watching first and foremost otherwise you're not gonna if you're always being strung along and never thrown a bone or get any sort of sense of conclusion or payoff then you're gonna lose interest and this i think unfortunately is falling into that same trap so as a season finale it gets a four anyway <laughs> that is it for my review of house of the dragon i will be be here on Monday night at 9 p.m. East Coast time, joined by Darren and Alyssa. See how they feel about this episode to talk about this, go into a lot more detail and jump into this finale. So be sure to join us for that. The link to that will be in the description below. And be sure to check out my channel for many other videos as I cover mostly Star Trek and other things as well so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that and thanks a lot for watching